Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the epistle or letter of Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 8. You can find it on page 1087 of your pew Bible. Say amen when you got it. Oh, that wasn't too convincing. Sounds like we got a few old lords out there. Ah, that was better. There we go. Okay, let's read beginning at the first verse, chapter four. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, with which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is on page 955 of your pew Bible. It's Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. It's known as the parable of the dishonest manager. <clears throat> And the word reads as follows. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Are you ticklish? You know you're ticklish if you squirm and giggle when your friend tickles your feet. If you laugh until you cry when someone touches a sensitive area on your body, you're ticklish. Some people are so ticklish that they laugh or cringe 
at the slightest touch or even the anticipation of being tickled. My buddy Dave, who's been here before, if you go like this to him, he starts to crack up hysterically because he's so ticklish. You just have to go like, like if I'm, if Dave's sitting where Glenn is and I go like this, he goes, <laughs> he just starts laughing. I do it to amuse myself a lot. I go, hey, Dave. And he just starts laughing. <laughs> like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> I'm easily amused, though, so you know that. But, but there is also another meaning to ticklish. You're also ticklish if you're easily upset or irritated. You're considered a ticklish person. For you, ticklish, ticklish sub, subjects, that's why it was hard to say, ticklish subjects might include political controversies, conspiracy theories, or even which musician should have won a Grammy Award. Might be a, that might be a ticklish topic for you. And that means those topics are particularly charged for you. That means it requires a careful, tactful person to keep you from getting upset about them. Are you ticklish? I would like us to take a moment this morning and just think to yourself, what ticklish topics do you have in your life? And I'm not going to ask you to share them, but I want you to consider some that might be intense for you, like robots versus human employees, Roe versus Wade, evolution versus creation, nature versus nurture, Airbnb versus our cemetery sanctity, you know, stuff like that. It will fit in quite nicely with this message. So thank you for doing that. Have you ever wondered why you can't tickle yourself? You ever wondered that? You cannot tickle yourself. It is impossible. The reason, well, they did a study on it, just so you know, because somebody else was wondering why. So they did a study and they found out that the part of the brain called the cerebellum so you have a cerebrum and a cerebellum, right? Those are the two big sections of the brain. The, cele the cerebellum can predict sensations when your own movement causes them. So if you go to tickle yourself, the cerebellum knows you're going to tickle yourself and it cancels the reaction. But it can't do it when other people do it because it can't predict the sensation. So if somebody else tickles you, that's why it works because the cerebellum can't understand what's going to happen. So you get tickled. I know you guys have all been wondering about that, so wonder no longer, okay? There you go. Are you ticklish? So our reading from 2 Timothy this morning, it sounds a bit different in other translations. Our Pew Bible said that people will have itching ears, but I'd like to look at it in the NASB version, which is the New American Standard Bible. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Ears tickled. Are you ticklish? In the message version, it's rendered this way. You're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching but will fill up on spiritual junk food. They will, they will turn to catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on the truth and they will chase mirages. These people want to hear things that will tickle their fancy. They have no stomach for solid teaching. They rather desire spiritual junk food. Instead of feeding on the pure word of God and the bread of life, they want boneless Bible wings. They want, they want chicken nugget church services. They want cotton candy commandments. They want bonbon beatitudes. They want lollipop love, Twinkie testimonies, popsicle prayers, syrupy sermons, and Hershey's Holy Spirit. See where I went there? Yeah. Okay. They want sugared down versions of God's way and truth. They want easy, pleasy, presby pew philosophies. Tickle my ears. 
but don't poke them, just tickle. They chase mirages like the Prozac Jesus. He just makes you feel better. And then there's the suggestion box Jesus. His law is more advice than commands. It's just a suggestion. Then there's the district attorney Jesus. A lot of people like him. He's the one who's going to get back at all those people who made your life hard. District attorney Jesus, get them, sick them. And then there's the Neiman Marcus Jesus. He's going to deliver all your golden dreams. And then there's the match.com Jesus who will bring you the perfect mate. Oh, there's also the vacation planner, Jesus. He'll take you to a place where life is more pleasurable. <sighs> Get a drink with an umbrella by the pool, right? All of these are mirages. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He will be nothing else. He will play no other part. He is not a spiritual genie who gives us three wishes when we rub the lamp just the right way. He is the great I am. There's no sugarcoating that. These times that Paul is referring to in our reading this morning are happening right now. There are people who have these ears that are itchy and they want them tickled. In a chapter immediately before chapter four, chapter three of 2 Timothy, Paul wrote this. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such people as these. Does this sound anything like the world today? All you have to do is turn on the news to see every one of those things every day. And the last phrase there talks about people who hold to a form of godliness, although they deny its power. That's talking about people who claim to be religious, who said that they're good spiritual folk, but they deny the power of God through their actions. How so, you may ask? I'm glad you did, because I have an answer. They don't pray much. They don't want to bother God or bother to talk to him. They don't read the Bible much, if at all. They try to look good, but their hearts can be judgmental, bitter, or complaining. Jesus told us we can know the false people among believers by their fruit. So what do we see in people's lives? Are they showing fruit from the right spirit or are there red flags? Because you've heard the expression, where there is smoke, there is fire. Amen? And I don't mean when we make mistakes because everyone does. Right? Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. When we say when we say we know them by their fruits, this means that you see consistent wrongdoing, obvious things. People can maintain a facade, a false front, if you will, for a little while, but eventually the truth comes out. The Bible says that your sin will find you out. And it's true. It will be exposed. Actions speak louder than words. False religion reveals itself. The fake will always be, will always be evident when examined by the original master. Are you ticklish? Falsehood in religion has been around for centuries. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, his friends called him Zeke, by the way, uh, he said, and her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them. They say, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. We had these false prophets who were whitewashing the people's behavior, telling them what they wanted to hear, telling them lies, things that they wanted their ears, the, the itching ears, they wanted them to be tickled. And they claimed that they were speaking for God. And in Jeremiah, we see the same thing. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes?
So God is saying that the false prophets are talking nonsense and the priests are following their instructions. But the worst part is it says, my people love to have it so. So they like it. God is saying that the people with their itchy ears are wanting these lies to tickle their fancies. But these people are in the wrong. In Proverbs, they are denounced. In Proverbs 17, it says, an evildoer listens to wicked lips and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. So these people are evildoers and liars listening to these false prophets and teachers. In the book of James, who is Jesus' brother, he warned us this way. Do not become teachers in large numbers, my sisters and brothers, since you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. The stricter judgment is for teaching and preaching erroneous doctrine, wrong things. You see, when you are a preacher or a teacher, you have this authority attached to you. And people respect that because you're a preacher, you're a teacher. You must know what you're talking about. So the judgment for people like myself is stronger when we teach, when we preach, because we have to preach the right things. Because if we lead people astray, then we are just like these false prophets and shepherds that are talked about in the Old Testament. God despises that. That's not a word he uses very lightly. He despises that. In Proverbs, there's a scripture that says that there's seven things that God hates, but the one that he hates the most is a person who sows discord among brothers and sisters. He hates that. He despi the other things are an abomination to him, but he hates that one thing. Because division belongs to the enemy. You cannot pray the prayer of agreement if you are divided. The prayer of agreement Jesus said, if two of you agree about anything on the earth, it will be done by the Father in heaven. How can you agree about praying together if you can't even talk to each other? Or you can't even be in the same room? Or you can't even look at each other? You can't pray. That's why Satan's biggest weapon against the church is division. It's always been and it always will be. But the scripture says that we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen? The stricter doctrine... It's preaching what I like to call comfortable religion. And what do I mean by religion or religiosity? Well, I can tell you one thing. Jesus despised it. Who's the group that he came against the most? And they were the religious folk, weren't they? The most religious folk in the entire nation of Israel, right? These were the, these were the, the guys, right? It's going through the motions, like the song said this morning. It looks good. You go through rituals, repetitions, ceremonies, fine garments, golden chalices, whatever. But you miss the heart of God. You are unmotivated by his Holy Spirit. Instead, you have <clears throat> a Pharisee spirit, like wanting to crucify Christ for healing on the Sabbath, rather than rejoicing for the one who was healed. That's awesome. You just witnessed a miracle of God, and you're worried about which day he did it on. I think you just missed something. You care more about the appearance of something to you, and you don't see that maybe God is using it to bless someone else. That's why I believe that Paul really stressed to, Tim to Timothy what he needed to do as a pastor. Right after the part about the tickling ears and following mirages, Paul said to Timothy, I can't impress this on you too strongly. God is looking over your shoulder. Christ himself is the judge with the final say on everyone living and dead. He is about to break into the open with his rule. So proclaim the message with intensity. Keep on your watch, challenge, warn, and urge your people. Don't ever quit, just keep it simple. Or, as I have said before, my job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Whenever I'm speaking, if you're feeling afflicted, you know which one you are. 
words to live by for those of us in the pulpit. A man named Adam Hamilton once said this, as a pastor, I have a deep desire to lead people to God and encourage people to read the Bible and carry their faith into every part of their lives. I agree with this brother. That is my deep desire for all of you, all of you. I want to challenge, to warn, and urge you all. Because you see, you are my sheep, the ones that God has entrusted to me to be your shepherd. I am an under-shepherd. I am under the great shepherd of the sheep. That's who I report to. And the session too, don't forget that. No matter, no matter how things may appear at times, I am here because God sent me. My heart is constantly burdened for your spiritual growth and understanding. My wife, Lauren, and I care deeply about every person who walks into this church and sits in these pews, every single one. We are not here to tickle your ears or to tickle your fancy. God commands us to be completely otherwise. To proclaim the message with intensity, to challenge, to warn and urge you, to feed you with solid food, the pure word of God, to help you grow with healthy fruit, to encourage you to refrain from judging what you cannot fully understand because you haven't walked a mile in anyone else's shoes. We never know what the next person is going through been through, or whatever. To encourage you to refrain from hurtful gossip and criticism, but instead to love and see that others need your love, not your disdain or contempt. To show you who God is so that you can know him more fully. To always extend forgiveness and urge you to do the same. Because God commands us to. And it's for our sake and spiritual well-being. So are you ticklish? Because God does not desire for you to be ticklish. And nor do I. He prefers that you laugh in the face of junk food religion. Put down those Twinkie testimonies. And that you would rather sit on a pew and be challenged rather than be tickled by a feather. So forgive me if I poke and prod a little bit or if I challenge or tug at your ears every Sunday. I don't expect you to laugh. I only expect you to relax, to see and listen with God's heart. And please don't be ticklish. Amen.